This is the most vulnerable population to nutrient deficiencies. This is where you don't want to miss out on a single nutrient, not even for a minute. There are steps there that you may never get a chance to, to, to correct. It's really the young people, especially young women, um, who need to be uh, uh, who need to have better information mm -hmm. about how these diets affect not only their health, but if they're planning to have children, the health of those children. So this is the most vulnerable uh, population to nutrient deficiencies um, are are pregnant women and uh, and developing children. So this is where you don't want to miss out on a single nutrient, not even for a minute. Yeah. Uh, so uh, during brain development, that that's, that's a, that's a, the, there are steps there that you may never get a chance to, to, to correct. So I think that, um, one of the reasons I wrote this book and there's a, there's a chapter in the book called the plant-based brain, which explains exactly what happens if you don't have animal foods in the diet, when the brain is developing to try to help people understand how dangerous this is. Uh, and you don't hear that when in mainstream messaging about plant-based diets, you never hear the ifs, ands, and buts about vegan diets. You know, you it's safe if, it's safe, but it's safe, you know, and, and so it, it this is a very, very slippery slope. Um, and it, I think people need to know what the risks are so that they can make informed choices. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm really glad you said that because I've, I've, you hear these things bouncing around and I've, I've seen some uh, things, but they, like you say, they're epidemiology and I, I just, uh, right. you know, and that's why I wanted to sort of see, obviously this is, this is your field. So I always wanted to ask that of, you know, a, a psychiatrist who actually knew the study. So that's, that's different. And I think that's very fair. You know, we just don't have the experimental data to really say one way or the other. I mean, I certainly feel worse when I eat plants. You know, my, my <laughs> is, is clearly affected by that, um, but certainly not for everybody. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's so good that you point out, you know, they don't talk about the if, ands, or buts. I was just talking to someone about this the other day and uh, they were, they were saying that they had a, they had a horrible reaction to, uh, it was actually a patient, a horrible reaction to uh, these veggie chips. And they've been mostly carnivore and they had this big reaction to mm. that. So there's that, that sort of that thing again, where you had this big reaction, but um, she just, she was really, really unwell. She did not feel good. She ended up having to leave this party and she didn't know what was going on. She ended up looking up these veggie chips and she started, found that there were these tapioca powder that was, uh -huh. in. and, um, and there was a sort of a rash of these apparently with those veggie chips and the tapioca powder, apparently it had a much higher level of, of cyanide in them that, um, than they, they normally should have. And, apparently they had something and they normally should have. I love yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was, that was the thing the, the WHO said that up to 10 milligrams of cyanide was okay. Right. And so it was like, okay, well, these, this bag of chips had like 160 or something like that. So it, it was much higher, but that's the thing. No one says that 10 milligrams is, is enough and say, Hey, this bag has 10 milligrams of cyanide one bag per day only as per the WHO and you meet your maximum <laughs> cyanide requirements. We're like, Whoa, what the, what, what? You know, that no one's going to eat that. No one's going to buy that. But it's irresponsible not to say that. And we have these yes. different toxins that we know about, that we can quantify, that we can say causes harm at this line. And the WHO says causes harm at this line at 10 milligrams. And yet no one says that. It doesn't say that people down, you know, they're, they're, they're designed to be highly palatable. They're designed to be addictive. And just you want another chip and another chip and another chip. And you down exactly. bags of these things. So it's designed to have you surpass that threshold and no one tells you about it, which I, I think is, is extraordinarily irresponsible and, and pretty scary that that happens. It is. And so, uh, in the fruits and vegetables chapter of my book, I talk about cassava in particular, mm. um, as being, uh, a, a food that I, a food, I don't, I wouldn't call it a food. I yeah. call it, <laughs> uh, uh, it, this is, uh, th that it, that is dangerous. And uh, it depends on the source and it depends on the amount, but why would you want to expose yourself to any amount of cyanide? Yep. Uh, cyanide is a mitochondrial poison. Why would you want to do that to yourself? And uh, and you don't always know how much is in the product. And I, I tried to try to understand it. I put this in the book, you know, um, some, com some countries have different thresholds in terms of how much cyanide is allowed to be in their cassava products. Every country's different. 
So depending where you live, you might be getting uh, you might be getting products that are 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 not as safe as some other ones. I I I I really do consider cassava to be one of those one of those products that people need that people should avoid if they want optimal mental health. And so when I'm designed these diets in the book, the, the paleo and keto and carnivore diets, I modify them to be. I can call them quiet diets because they're now they're they're not with the exception of the carnivore diet they're not plant free, mm -hmm. but the paleo and the ketogenic diets are they're free of for example cassava and nightshades and the things that have neurotoxins in them, to to the degree that I think they're worth everybody avoiding. Um, so so these diets are quieter they're quieter on your gut they're quieter on your immune system they're quieter on your mitochondria your nervous system your thyroid, um, and you know, helping people understand that not all plant foods are created equal. So if you're going to eat the rainbow, you will pay a price because, because some plant foods are, are more aggressive than others. And if you understand the difference, you can make your own choices and you can do your own experiments. See, well, you know, how do I do with nightshades? Uh, I don't think anybody should eat cassava. How do I do with flaxseed? Flaxseed, you grind up flaxseed, you also get trace amounts of cyanide. And people are, people who are honestly care about their health are make are putting flaxseed in their smoothies they're sprinkling it on top of their cereal and putting in their yogurt without realizing that there is uh some perhaps cumulative risk involved it's hard to know it's hard to know exactly um how these foods will affect you um unless you remove them so and and i think i think again you know i like to say you know, cause I work with all different kinds of people and will help anybody optimize the diet of their choice. I'm nutritionally pro-choice. I just want people to have the right information so that they can make an informed choice, understanding the risks and benefits, and then going in with clear eyes and knowing that, okay, if, if you prefer not to eat mammals, um, uh, or, or any animal, if you, I mean, mammals is a different story. I think that's, a. a, a you, know, you don't have to eat mammals. You can eat other kinds of animals to get your animal nutrients. But if you prefer not to eat animals, here are the risks involved in that. Um, and then you can decide what's most important to you and make your own choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we touched on you know different clinical trials and the lack thereof, but and and you talk about in your clinical experience that that this had, had benefited so many people, but there's also, you've also uh, conducted some clinical trials as well in, in nutrition and how that affects mental health. Is that correct? Hey everyone, really happy to announce a new sponsor of the show for everyone in Australia, and that is Stockman Steaks, who deliver steaks and other meats direct to customer, delivering high quality grass fed and grass finished, pasture raised beef and other meats frozen to your door. They have high fat options for those of us on a keto carnivore diet, and you can even order grass fed and finished beef fat trimmings that you can fry up and add to your meal for the extra fat with high omega-3 fatty acids in it. If you're in Australia, unfortunately, they're not shipping outside of Australia at the moment, but hopefully they'll be moving into other markets soon. So in Australia, you can use code Chafee for a free order of beef mints or another free gift as it may change from time to time. So just go down to stockmansteaks.com.au today and place your order now. Thanks, guys. So I co-authored a study uh, in 2022 I did not conduct the study, but I put the study together and analyzed it with, with some help with uh, from Dr. Eric Westman and Dr. Laura Saslow, who have a lot of experience publishing uh, science papers. And uh, But I, I pulled together all of his information and, uh, and wrote the paper. And uh, I'm really, really um, pleased that this paper has gotten as much attention as it has because um, people need to understand what what happened in this study. It, it really, I think, if pe more people knew about it, I think I think it would be uh, it would it, it could bring some very positive attention to the power of dietary intervention for mental health. So what my so my friend and colleague, Dr. Albert Jana, he's a psychiatrist in Toulouse, France, who's been practicing psychiatry for more than thirty five years now, and has you know worked largely with. Uh, uh, people from uh, of North African and French descent with serious chronic mental illnesses. And uh, so some of these patients he's worked with for decades. Mm -hmm. And so what he decided to do, uh, he had witnessed a family member improve within just a few weeks 
on a ketogenic diet in terms of autism symptoms and epilepsy, became seizure-free on a ketogenic diet and reduced symptoms of autism substantially. He thought, again, this diet seems to be good for the brain. You know, could this diet help my patients, some of my patients who aren't getting better enough or haven't responded to all of the medications that I've been prescribing and the, the psychotherapy and, and hospitalizations. Every I've been using every tool in my toolbox to help these people and they're not getting better. Maybe this, let, let, you know, maybe this could help. So he invited 31 of his most treatment resistant patients with uh, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, severe major depression. These were patients uh, uh, with uh, taking an average of five psychiatric medications, not at all unusual in the chronic mental uh, illness uh, field. Uh, in the cases of chronic mental illness, you often see multiple medications prescribed. So an average of five medications, and they had been in treatment with Dr. Dana for an average of 10 years, some of them 30 years, right? So he invited 31 of them to come into the hospital voluntarily to try a simple whole foods, mildly ketogenic diet under his supervision in the hospital. And 28 of those 31 patients were able to stay on the diet for more than two weeks, which is what you need to do to start to see the, the changes happen. So 28 of those people continued with the study. And by week three, after about three weeks, and this is what we see in clinical practice all the time, uh, after about three weeks, all of them had improved. All of them had improved, regardless of the nature of their diagnosis, the duration of their diagnosis, the number or type of medications they were taking. And 44% uh, of them achieved clinical remission Wow! from serious chronic mental illness. And this uh, that's why I thought it was worth publishing. And this was not a randomized controlled trial. He didn't divide his patients into two groups and compare one against the other. So, you know, we can't say uh, technically from a scientific standpoint, we can't say that the ketogenic diet was directly responsible for these improvements. That's why we need randomized controlled trials, which are in the works already uh, around the world. Uh, but the, but what we can, but these were all patients who had been hospitalized one or more times before in this very same hospital or a sister facility in the same region that uses the same protocols under the care of this very same psychiatrist and had never seen results like this before. So we'd like to think that the ketogenic diet had something to do with it. Uh, and, uh, and quite a few of those patients uh, opted to continue some version of that diet even after they left the hospital. So I think that this is, uh, I think that this is uh, something that, that, it gives people hope. I mean, most people who are in situations like that believe that they have already tried everything and their doctors think that they've already tried everything. But there are some very powerful interventions available that most people have never tried. So I think it'd be great if more people knew about that. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'll, I'll put a link to that study in the description as well, as well as a link to your book. And um, which I think is, is just absolutely fantastic. And I really love the work that you've been doing. I've, I've been really looking forward to talking to you. Um, and so this, is, this has been absolutely wonderful. Beyond that, I think any, anybody who's watching who already knows something about me knows that I have a lot of food sensitivities that may sticking to any diet, uh, especially when you're traveling, very difficult. So 